Hi, everyone. Um, today we're going to have a really interesting uh, webinar on mark marking and labeling connection collections. And I, I want you to know that all of the websites that are going to be in the slides are in the handout. So you don't have to scramble to write down um, the uh, websites and resources. And when I post the recording, I'll also post the slides. So I'm going to do my thing. The next um, webinar is on deaccessioning. That'll be on November 19th. And then after that, for the holiday season, we're going to have one on caring for collections during seasonal events, and that's December 3rd. And uh, I'll tell you about the, the uh, 2016 um, webinars when we get closer to them. If you have a problem and you need answers for caring for your collections, you can always go to the online community forum. Um, the one thing is you have to be registered to ask a question or to answer a question, but you can read the questions and answers without being registered. And registration doesn't cost anything. It's, it's easy. This is our website, and uh, we're on Facebook. We're also on Twitter. And you can always contact me. This is my email address. And so and we're going to have an evaluation. We'll, we'll put the, this uh, website up later again, too. So uh, today we have Nora Lockshin. We're going to do uh, marking and labeling collections. So take it away. Hi there. I hope I'm live. Can I you are. It? Fantastic. Well, hello, everybody. I'm so excited to be here today. I see there's a lot of people registered, and the number is uh, climbing. And we have people from apparently as far away as Peru and Australia. So thank you so much for attending. Um, I do have quite a lot of slides, probably too many. So I'm going to do my best to speak a little bit and not go off script. Uh, so we can get through all the topics I have and thoughts uh, today. And I'm already going off, so here we go. Uh, but just to let you know, I'm not going to be keeping my eye on the chat window. Susan will be pulling questions over to uh, a little parking lot so we can address them in the Q&A session. So without further ado, I'm going to get started. So as some of you have seen in the bio, if you got to read it, um, I have been around museums for quite a long time, actually over 20 years. Uh, but my experience is formed mostly in the realm of libraries, archives, and framed works in exhibitions. Since I've been at the Smithsonian for a good half of that career, I've consulted on many varied collections, from anthropological to artwork, specimens, spaceflight artifacts, you name it. Being an archives conservator at the Smithsonian means I get a lot of interesting questions, as I alluded to. Uh, specifically, here's one that is going to carry us through uh, some of the presentation. Uh, early on in my career, I was asked if I could help with a canoe, uh, an outrigger canoe, um, to which I said, really? Uh, I'm a paper conservator. Uh, but they went on to explain that it had these labels on it that transliterated native words for the oars and the parts of the boat. And those were the singular and perhaps unique record of that, that language. And so uh, I went on to work on it. Oh, and I'm going to figure out my controls here. I'm so used to using my keyboard. Here we go. So here's the canoe. I admit that uh, it threw me for a moment, but then I soon realized it wasn't very different from what I usually do. For instance, it's quite like working on end papers uh, that are attached to wooden boards in ancient bound manuscripts. It's paper attached to wood, and you want to keep it there generally. If you'll forgive the pun, um, this canoe is going to come up again later as an object lesson because it offers me a lot of talking points. But first of all, I am going to let you in on a little secret. This presentation might actually disappoint some of you. And why would that be? Well, with apologies to our friend Dr. McCoy here, and I hope this translates across international boundaries. Star Trek uh, has met us on a lot of places. Um, I'm a conservator, not a registrar. Generally speaking, with rare exceptions, we're not the ones usually marking or labeling objects. As I've said before in another forum, the only mark a conservator wants to leave generally is no mark at all. And I'm going to move ahead. So 
I'm not a collections manager. Uh, I'm not a registrar. I'm, let's see, hang on, moving two screens here, nor a cataloger in books and libra in library situations. A lot of times uh, marking is done in the technical services department, but also in cataloging and acquisitions. So we're going to go to our first poll and ask who's actually here with us today. I see your names, but I don't really know what you do. So if Susan can push the first poll, we'll hopefully be able to look at this later and I'll learn a little bit more about you. But meanwhile, so here, uh, here we go, I'm watching it. So you've got quite a few options. Scroll down, pick one. If more than one applies to you, go ahead and answer that. Moving forward. So let me tell you why I actually am here today. I was honored uh, about a year ago with a nomination to offer an original contribution to a sequel to this set of books, Storage of Natural History Collections. Actually, Susan, I'm going to try and move my poll over because it's blocking my slides. Hang on a second. Minimize. Well, I'm just going to go for my paper slides then. Thank you so much. All right, so I was asked to write a chapter for this book, Storage of Natural History Collections, which was published in two volumes. And is actually, the second volume is out of print, but it is available online at stashc.com. Based on my own work with historic labels and archival documents, for the upcoming revision, I was asked to write a new chapter that specifically deals with concerns of marking and labeling. So here's the thing, if I don't actually do marking of collections most of the time, who am I to lead this discussion? Well, much like most of my chapter, which had a word limit, there's not enough time here today to tell you everything there is to be done. But what I can do is take you through what my literature search, interviews with many colleagues of diverse backgrounds, and my own experience and research while writing this chapter has taught me. So. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen this, this little gif is uh, a scene from the movie National Treasure with Nicolas Cage explaining to you very sagely, do you know what the preservation room is for? Apparently, it's not necessarily for marking up objects. What I do know is that I can't give you the best tool and the best ink and the best way to fix a mistake. There are far too many considerations and options out there, and your resources might not permit them all. On a brighter note, I am here to guide you towards best practices where you can find steps to critical decision making by reviewing the multitude of really good literature that's already out there and to point you towards resources both in print, online, and workshops that there are out there that you can take for further education. So let's start off at the very beginning. We'll start off with the meaning and definitions for clarity. As the title of this workshop, of this seminar indicates, we're here to talk about marks and labels. To be very clear, they generally serve the same purpose. And in the chapter I've written for publication, I use those two words, mark and label, somewhat interchangeably. And I will show you that actually in the chapter here, I'm, I'm weirdly quoting myself, which is odd, but I'm going to point out that the definition of label as I use it is confined to a semi or permanent mark applied or attached to an object. And so I use it somewhat interchangeably, except where noted, linked to the catalog accession record in history and contemporary museum practice. And when I call out mark as something different, if you're describing an object, say uh, metalware or pottery, there may already be a mark, a hallmark. That is a very specific word that tells you a little bit about the object. And that would dis be distinguished from any label that you would apply or written other information. So next slide. So why do we do this? Why do we mark priceless and historic artifacts? Well, humans like to determine order. We also like to establish control and ensure against loss. We like to be able to find and care for our things. Beyond that, as museum people, we adhere to guidelines and standards among ourselves so that we are worthy of the public or private trust that has been placed in us. 
and some of those guidelines and standards uh, are referred to in the handouts. Um, you may recognize some of them, but I'll just spell them out. AAM is American Alliance of Museums. They recently changed their name from association. Um, we've got ICROM, which is uh, Institute for Goodness Preservation uh, and Conservation of Cultural Property. It doesn't exactly align because of the international language uh, differences. Um, there's another group called the AZA, American Zoological Association. Um, and ALA stands for American Library Association. But there are many more out there, of course. We also mark and label for further interpretation and arrangement and powerful use of metadata surrounding our physical objects. Through numbering and description, we can relate objects to each other beyond the physical boundaries in virtual catalogs. So um, I've called out there a bullet for wayfinding. Also, labels today sometimes have technological technology embedded in them. You can actually do inventories with smart labels. Um, I don't talk about it much in this lecture, but it is addressed in my uh, chapter for an upcoming book. Um, but those of you that are familiar with using a book catalog or your own public library catalog that tells you that there's a book in the system, but it's not at your library, that helps you find your way to another edition under the same call numbers and etc. But it might be the fifth copy. So those are familiar for the public, but in-house we also do lots of things uh, that go on uh, further. And I'll show you a little example of that later on. So the accession number. The accession number is sort of a holy thing, like uh, something to be respected and not interfered with, until it is. On the right, uh, you have an image of a catalog description for that outrigger canoe. Uh, and it's pretty long, right, in the notes. It actually has quite, it also shows me that actually that boat has had quite a few different numbers associated with it. I'll, I don't expect you to be able to squint and read that, so I'm going to blow that up for you a little bit. And uh, from the notes, in fact, this object, which is 02085, was also referred to as USNM. E160, etc., but it was also 307215 and even 67111. So, which number is correct? Which one stands for it? Which do we believe? Um, so, what I've done is I've blown up the little left side of that slide, and you can see that I'm actually there working on the label. And I'm going to pull my, ar my arrow pointer down for a second, and I don't expect you to see this, I can barely see this. But right here, let's see. Oh, my little arrow isn't moving that quickly. Heck. Oh, hi. I'm sorry. I'm just seeing a note that my mic is kind of low. I'm trying to move it a little bit closer. Hopefully, that will make an adjustment. At any rate, for those who can hear me, um, I am working on a label, and the accession number is mostly going into the little missing chunk of paperwork. And it says 2, 0, possibly 0, possibly 8, possibly 5, but it definitely starts with the 02. You can also see that in this slide, they eventually decided on that upper number, 20085. But if you look at the number 67111, I'll ask you to keep your eyes on it for a second, that number actually still persists in one of these virtual catalogs. The number persists in literature and early citations. So if you look into the accession record in the catalog, it links to this online version of a 1923 citation that references 67111. So we're going to switch gears now. I know that some of, you, some of you listeners are probably familiar with the notion of agents of deterioration of museum collections. I'll spare you all of them just to focus on one. From a holistic risk, risk assessment perspective, as defined by Canadian Conservation Institute's Rob Waller and Paisley Cato, one of the 10 agents of deterioration of museums collections is disassociation or dissociation, excuse me. I want you to focus here 
on the third sentence. Sorry, let me go back. That third sentence, dissociation results in the loss of objects or object-related data or the ability to retrieve or associate objects and data. We can lose object data via physical damage to the label, loss due to adhesive failure, or catastrophic loss such as disaster or theft. Now we'll discuss some basis and rationale for having standards and guidelines and best practices, and some do's and don'ts, ideally to follow them. Again from CCI, uh, you'll note this really excellent uh, image of lovely, clear numbering, contrasting uh, color, uh, beautifully written, I think on this uh, bone fragment, I think it is, while paying attention to neat handwriting, clarity, and contrast, there is a failure here to note the orientation of the object and its number. Without serifs, note this is a non-serif font, it's really hard to tell which way is up. Uh, an alternate uh, solution here could have been to use an underline to indicate that that is a 9 and not a 6 on uh, the other way around. Symmetry can be confusing, and that could lead to loss if somebody decided to file this in the drawer that had the 18,000 series as opposed to the 10,000 series. Even if the object is there, if you've not been able to understand the meaning of the numbering, this is dissociation. So I'm going to go further and give you some, de some definite do's. Do check your references and resources. Some of those are in your handout, and we'll go through a couple of them in later slides. Get training. You're here today. This is already a training. You've already learned one proper thing about how to orient numbers uh, so that people can read them. Uh, ask questions. If you have uh, people who've been there a really long time, ask why something is done that way, or if they know of how this material has been done uh, before. Ask if you know what the material is, if you're not sure uh, what it is. And ask if you can get more training. Make space and time for yourself to do this. A rushed job can result in easy mistakes that are hard to reverse and take a lot of time to recover from after. And test and practice your techniques. What uh, our friends from, again, the film National Treasure are demonstrating exactly is what not to do. Please don't use untested materials on important collections objects. Um, for anyone who hasn't seen the film, I'm just going to tell you, I, I did not see the film until this past week, and I said, I have to watch this because I've been hearing about <laughs> I've been hearing about this infamous lemon juice scene for years, and so for you, I watched National Treasure, and it was a hoot, honestly, so uh, enjoy it. But please don't go ahead and, and squirt lemons uh, to reveal faded lettering on uh, a document or object that you have in front of you. And don't do it for the first time on a collection object. There's plenty of opportunity to pick up something in a thrift store, or perhaps you have deaccessioned uh, collections or props that can be practiced on. But if you're interested in trying to figure out on how to write on ceramics, pick up an inexpensive dish at, at a thrift shop or try something from home first and see what how your little paints and your markers behave. Let's see. Oh, I think we've got a little break coming up. And by which I mean it's another poll. So in fact, how did you learn how to mark collection objects? I've got a couple of options there for you while I take a drink of water. Oh, hurrah, I see some of these answers coming in. Indeed, um, I'm not sure if this was split into two polls. But for those of you, um, if there's a yes or no, it would be great if you wanted to answer as well. If you are directly responsible for labeling and irregular duties, or if you supervise other people, wow, this is going really fast. I see lots of, lots of excellent, wow. Yep, 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 yep. Okay, I'm moving on. While you answer that, 
I'm going to just take an opportunity to say that uh, a colleague of ours likes to point out that what, what we're trying to provide here is a no shame zone. Uh, you are here to learn and teach me, valuable, teach me also with valuable questions from your perspective. So I might be showing some images of some fantastic, perfect looking labels, but I'll show some kind of funky ones too. If you recognize them, please don't shout them out in the chat room. Some of those collections would prefer to remain nameless, and I thank them for sharing their time uh, with me to take some pictures of some labels that uh, probably should be remediated in some way. So, moving on. So many options. How do you choose what to do? This quizzical little pug expresses perfectly at how some of us feel about marking and labeling. With some training, beginning training, or none at all, and possibly a bewildering array of materials of value in your collection, how do you choose the right system or method? This, I found, uh, is a just gorgeous way to sum it up. This essential proverb-like statement about collection stewardship from the American Alliance of Museums pretty much sums it up. Whether you're talking about what kind of building to build, or how to light an exhibit, or how to mark an object, you've just got to know, you've got to know what stuff you have in front of you, and know what stuff you need. From a legal and standards perspective, pretty much, that you'll find that those with whom you wish to exchange items will agree. You will also find brief similar guidance in agreed upon guidelines that must be adhered to for accreditation and loans in such organization as ICOM, the International Council of Museums, and ICROM. So those are brief guidelines, like items should be marked in a manner that it's safe. But how do we do that explicitly? Well, first, I'm going to break it down for you with some principles I've sort of gathered for decision making. So this uh, was turned into a handout, so if you want to pull the handout of flowcharts, you may, or simply follow along on the slides. First of all, identify your object. What is the substrate? The substrate's just a fancy word that conservators like to use for the material, what is the, the type of surface that you are meaning to apply a number to. And of course, if you have something like uh, a, wood, a metal handled cane, you have a couple of substrates. You have metal and you have wood. I'm being simplistic in this slide by playing the first uh, but like playing the game 20 questions uh, for a substrate. Is it animal? Is it vegetable? Is it mineral? Mineral. You could also ask yourself uh, a few other questions. So that just this is just sort of flow chart thinking. Ask yourself, what are its characteristics? And what are its vulnerabilities? Is it soft or hard? Is it porous? Is it absorbent? Is it smooth and slick? Is it chemically reactive? If you don't know anything about it, can you find out more from the artist's record of work? or the cultural norm of the culture that it comes from. For instance, uh, it's a culture that makes baskets, and what were the common materials uh, that were used, and possibly coatings that were used in that century or that time. Also, and this is a different color because it's a very different sort of concept, is what, and, and it's outside the object, external to the object, what are the storage considerations? Is this going to go immediately on exhibit? So you might want to put a really discreet label, or is it going to be handled by researchers? And you need to really be sure not to mark any important mark over any important features. Might it be going into cold storage, or might it be going into a fluid medium if it's a biological or a plant specimen? Alternately, is it going to be stored in an exterior environment for something like a farm collection? All of those. Uh, factors will affect the durability expectations for a system that you choose. Next principle, characterize it. So once you've figured out the surface, characterize that surface. So we picked one and you have a choice. Is it friable or is it durable? Friable, another fancy word for is it fragile? Does it flake? Is it powdery? So between those two, you can see the friable is in red. That might be something that you want to avoid. Moving on to other factors, are there colorants present, dyes or pigments? Are they soluble or insoluble in anything that you might want to apply, such as a barrier coat for applying uh, a number and then a top coat? Would it bleed or change? 
significantly. With some care and minimal training, you can learn to test for solubility through workshops. That's really, there are some guidance online. Uh, there may be a video or two for small testing, but it is uh, something best worked out uh, with someone who has done it before so as not to stain an object or mark it in some irreversible way. And then another line there, again, a little bit outside of this scope, is is it animate or is it inanimate? I know that not a lot of you necessarily have living collections, but think about this seminar as a way to instruct your whole career. And it's possible that you might move on to, uh, to a site that has animal collections. Next principle, once you've characterized, considerations. Please consider that labeling is a mini treatment that you are doing. You want to consider the size of the area that you're going to affect as well as the size of the information and how much you can conceivably fit in a way that communicates well to others. Placement, uh, not just for aesthetics. If you have a 400 pound sculpture, it's going to be really difficult to see the number if you have to turn over the sculpture. So you might want to do it on a side that's more or less accessible. You want to consider your users and your viewers. You want to consider any potential damage that you could do. And again, I've said unknowns. And you do want to consider your time. There are some ways of sort of speeding up your process by batching types of materials, or but you, you can't always control it. But try and identify time where you can sit aside, make the decisions properly, and not feel rushed about it. I know some of you are laughing right now. So. Let's go along this flow chart and think about choices. How do you choose? So you've picked a surface. You've decided, perhaps, that it's friable or porous, the red in the red section. So you may naturally want to avoid that particular area of the object. If you want to avoid writing on it directly or pasting a label on it because it might flake off, you can think about another option, such as a loop and a tag or a tag and a ribbon. Uh, or, in fact, putting a little card next to it and putting it in a container, an enclosure, and not marking the object at all. Alternately, I mentioned that sort of cane example, you might select another part of the object that has a more durable surface if that is an opportunity. If we go to the lower branch, you have something durable or non-porous or an absorbent, maybe you can use a barrier coat, which is a little bit of very selected, purpose-selected lacquer that then when it's dry, you might write on with a pencil or another marking device like brush or ink, and then consider putting a top coat on it. So we're going to go into looking actually at an object and thinking about this. I actually happen to pick an object that suits the earlier quality. Um, I, it's a bone fragment. Um, we're near Halloween. Some of my slides might get a little creepy. I didn't do that on purpose. Um, I, a lot of this information was gathered while working around natural history collections, so bear with me. I hope nothing will get too upsetting for anyone. Um, so that's a bone, and you can see on its left-hand side, I'm going to try using this pointer again. It's really just not behaving for me, so I'm sorry about that. Um, on the left side, you can see that there is a little number written. It's a little dark. There's been a little barrier layer filling in a little bit um, so that the person didn't have to didn't write into any little valleys of bone. But it's definitely more solid on the left side of the bone as opposed to the right side, which has some cellular structure, some breakdowns where really the information would be at risk. So imagine somebody bump, bumping or, or sliding with a cotton glove across that right side. You could easily write, rub off the number if this object was being handled by gloved hands. I'm going to move on to another object. So um, let's talk a little bit for a second about size and scale. Uh, here at the Smithsonian, we have very tiny things. This is not the tiniest, but it is a tiny. If you look at the tiny little uh, metric scale all the way on the left, we have a little tiny hand-woven basket that is possibly three millimeters across. It's adorable. We have stuff even smaller than that. But we also have very big things. So when we consider our collections, we are honestly categorizing things in terms of small, medium, and large these days, and large for us, is a space shuttle. Um, very happily, 
both of those space shuttles pictured there nose to nose on a historic day at our uh, National Museum of Air and Space. Uh, those are labeled. They already have labels on them. It says Enterprise and it says Discovery, so we know which is which. That is handy. Uh, but indeed, to get away from, from joking about it, it's really interesting to consider Discovery, which is with us now, is that one object or is it one object and it's hundreds of thousands of components? And I know some of you who are active in cataloging might have to accession each part within something like Discovery. And there are probably hundreds of thousands of parts in there that don't necessarily come out easily, some that do. Probably on based on NASA's practices, uh, probably every one of those parts already has a unique and individual serial number because that's how they do things over there. So the question is, do you need to label every single component part when it already has an identification on it that you can record and catalog from it because it might be unique? Just a question. Um, it's a question that's also relatable to our National Postal Museum. Uh, when I discuss with them, it's very interesting to note when you're counting collections, is a sheet of stamps, for, exa for example, postage stamps, is that one object or is it 40 objects? Because they're currency, they each have a value, and it really depends on who you talk to and how we are counting our collections. That's a very important thing to note. But moving back to something that's a little bit more realistic for collections managers, um, we're going to show some beetles now. So here is a beetle, and this is one of our very large beetles. It's actually the largest example of a beetle I believe we have in the show and tell collection of uh, the entomology department. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and right next to it is a very, very small beetle. And what you'll see to over from the very, very big beetle is a pin, a finger pointing to a pin, and then a little tiny dot, and that is actually the collected item, the smallest, tiniest beetle, which is actually much smaller than its label. So how are you going to label that? The question is, you don't. You label the pin that holds the tiny little beetle. Moving onward, let's talk about, let's keep talking about types of objects. And since we're in the world of natural history, let's take a detour into a special type of label and its relationship to the type of object. And here I'm talking about type specimens. So um, if any of you manage a collection with a natural history or a science education bent or have a cabinet of curiosities, you might come across these. These are lots of different labels for different uh, types of insects uh, for the most part. But one special thing about them is that you see a red coloration for those of you who do not have a color blindness issue. Uh, holotypes, that is the unique specimen from which all other specimens are named and identified, are always designated with the red coloration, whether that be a little line around the writing or a red colored tag. And under the butterfly over there, you see that the there's a sort of faded pinkish type label. So that is a very important thing and not necessarily to be uh, changed or altered because that tells you that that particular specimen is a very important one. Also, within ent entomology collections, at, at the very least, order on the label matters. In this particular instance, for pinned insects, the separation of information on the labels matters, with the most important information being placed closest to the specimen and additional information afterwards. And I've actually been working with our entomology scientists to come up with solutions for older labels that have been moved around a lot, and so their, their little holes are weakening and stretching and how to keep them in order. Um, so some of these pins I've seen can have up to five, ten labels on them. And yes, our entomologists look at them some under the microscope to read them and make them. Moving on to works on paper. Obviously, I have the most comfort uh, here because of my background, but I don't want to dwell on it because of that. I'm bringing it up because the rules are sometimes very different depending on the context. For instance, if we go forward to look at library collections, we are all used to library books, and in circulation, circulating collections, we're used to seeing barcodes and spine labels. So there's spine labels at the bottom of each of one of these, uh, these lovely books about collections, 
And all the way over there on the right, you see on the grayish book, there is a barcode at the bottom of that book. And the barcode is very useful for checking books in and out, obviously, and tracking their location. And the spine label is not just a label telling you what book it is, but where it goes. So many advancements have been made in barcoding and inventory control that now spread out to all sorts of collections. And there's a lot of great information out there, too much to put in this presentation, but I encourage you to look for, look for my chapter afterwards or contact me afterwards for an idea of where barcodes can help with inventory security and management control of your collections. So that's where we're used to seeing them on uh, new books, contemporary books. But in rare books and special collections, there is a great history of marking. Whether printed or manuscript books in, in special collections, we are used to seeing marks and labels like owner's annotations, book plates, and library stamps. Uh, let's take a look for a moment at this rather enthusiastically marked book. Uh, it has lots of marks on it, as you can see in the notes field of the catalog record. Um, it, so about midway there, it says local note, and it describes all the book plates and the inscriptions. So the question is, is this, hang on, I've lost my mouse, is this marking or is this mutilation? It's a real question today when you go into a print collection and you see these lovely, lovely prints from the 17th, 16th century with a big red property stamp uh, in, right in the middle of it. It's aesthetically annoying uh, and it, it sort of really makes you wonder about the value of, of the print and marking something up when someone was trying to get a visual uh, story across. For that, we take a look at the guidelines provided to us by uh, the American College and Research Library's Rare Books and Manuscripts section. There are guidelines specifically regarding security and theft in special collections. Um, there's Appendix 1 and Appendix 2. And interestingly, the librarian is guided against ever removing such marks when considering just the aesthetics or for deaccessioning. And I'm going to read aloud from Appendix 2, the draft model of legislation, theft and mutilation of library materials, which is way too small for you to read. And so the section says, the willful alteration or destruction of library ownership records, electronic or card catalog records, retained apart or applied directly to a book or other library property shall be considered prima facie evidence of intent to commit larceny of a book or other library property. So it really says if you're going to deaccession a book, you're going to pretty much want to stamp it deaccessioned. You're not going to want to remove a book plate or, or use a cancellation mark to say, no, not this collection. That's too easy for uh, a thief to want to do. That said, some collections with ample security might choose to use a different book uh, bookmark to bear the label information, like a barcode or a sticky. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we at Smithsonian shifted habits a little late, too late for this particular volume, which they themselves tweeted about. This is an early book example of an early book cloth binding uh, in the Americas, and there's some sticky stuff all over it. Today, we might have that in special collections with a bookmark holding that. Uh, those labels on them, but that's if the collection was under uh, reading room level security and not circulating. Continuing on the theme of security um, and Hollywood, Hollywood loves to make art crime an attractive pursuit. Since you see paintings here, this is a good opportunity for me to talk about whether you label collections that are received as loan or the backs of paintings and sealed frames. Um, usually for loans, this is done with temporary marking <coughs> and relies on extant markings on the object. I do know of one museum who received an irate call from an owner asking why the temporary loan label had been removed from their personally owned work when it went back to them. Of course, we all know that inclusion in a museum show can increase the value of an object, uh, and that one, mu one must be wary of the ethical considerations of accepting a loan for that very reason. So indeed, it's up to you to decide what your local guidelines are for that sort of thing. You don't want to imply uh, value, but generally you're publishing catalogs that say, indeed, this object was included in an exhibition. So you sort of have to go back and forth with your own collection management policy about that. Going back to the topic of security specifically, 
labels and markings are evidence, and it's not as uh, art theft is not nearly as pretty as Hollywood makes it seem. I'm going to add a note uh, that here that in my own line of work, I, I do get a lot of public inquiries, and I remember at least one caller. Hello, I'm a caller from so, so and so. I have a book, and it's got a stamp in it that I it's got some writing in it that I would like to remove. How would I go about doing that? And I try and treat all my callers equally. Um, but there was something about that call that made me a little suspicious. And, you know, of course, I cited our guidelines saying we don't generally remove marks. That's, uh, I'm not necessarily going to tell you how to do that. Uh, I have actually consulted for, uh, for some agencies uh, regarding allegedly purloined work, allegedly stolen work, and to look for evidence of tampering of uh, removal of marks of property. So that is something that we are trying to always walk a fine line with. Do we want to mark our collections permanently or in such a manner that it would be very uh, hard for someone with the bad intentions to change, alter, or remove? So I'm going to address a couple of special uh, topics. Uh, so you see the list of them there, living collections, some historic labels, plastics, health and safety. Again, I can't get to every type of object today, but I'm going to point you to where you can find out more about those. Judging by my literature review, I might be the first person to be writing about living collections into guidance on labeling for museum collections. Those guidelines and, and things are out there, but they're not necessarily included in the usual museum management. Uh, guidebooks on labeling that I have seen so far. Uh, so if, if I'm wrong, please correct me uh, later on by email, and I'll stop saying that. So again, you might not have any now, but if you move on to a collection that's a historic site uh, or works with live animals as part of the, your education, this may become relevant to you. So bear with me while I go through it. And it's also adorable, so we can talk about that too. Um, this is Winnie. Winnie is a penguin ambassador where, and for the Maryland Zoo in Baltimore, and she's making a public appearance here. Behind, she's behind the curtain just before the show uh, goes on, and she is introduced to the public, and uh, that people have an opportunity to interact with a penguin ambassador. And you can see on her wing that's facing you, she is actually wearing a little armband. It's her custom armband. I don't believe she wears this all the time, but it is useful for people to be able to recognize which penguin uh, they are working with, as well as uh, know her name if you want to call her. I'm not sure if she responds to her name, but I can uh, ask my friend Rick who took this picture <laughs> and find out. So let's talk a little bit about ethical guidelines for uh, the guidelines for ethical marking of animals. Uh, there are guidelines specified in the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Uh, there are guidelines specified in the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So you have international and then you have uh, more national groups that, that suggest guidelines for the non-harmful, um, you know, marking of animals. There are absolute reasons why you must actually do mark the animal. Sometimes in breeding programs, if an animal is going back and forth, you have to guarantee that that is the animal that you are speaking of, and that is one way that they track it. Um, and then besides guidelines, there are also actual regulations. I've just, uh, I'm only citing the American regulations here. Uh, international persons will want to check to their own guidance. Uh, but there is the Animal Welfare Act and Animal Wel Welfare Regulations to be found in Code 9. Uh, it's also called the Blue Book, which was a little confusing. It doesn't look blue to me. Um, but even in the URL string that you follow, it actually says the Blue Book in there somewhere. It must have been blue once. So if people are talking about the Blue Book, this is what they're talking about, rather than trying to name the numbers of the codes. So here's a quest quick question for you. How do you think one appropriate, appropriately would label a living collection? You know, you can answer this whether or not you have animals in your collection. And it's not just animals. <laughs> very carefully, that's very cute. Yeah, I see a few people are picking. Oh, these are some good answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Label on enclosure, microchips I'm seeing, tattoos. And I'm not seeing anybody object, which is 
great. And so we've got ear tags. Ah, we have plants. Somebody called out. In fact, yes, plants are also living collections. Meanwhile, I'm going to move on and show you my alternate title for my chapter or presentation is How Do You Tag an Elephant? Because we have them here. Uh, and in fact, uh, to, to sort of fill you in on the poll, most of the answers, it's, it's kind of a trick question, most of those answers are true. It really depends on the animal, the size of the collection, whether the animals can be recognized from individual characteristics, or you have perhaps uh, an impossibility of labeling when you have a whole collection of tiny frogs and as someone expressed to me sometimes sometimes a frog will die and you might not find it for a few weeks depending on the size of their enclosure so numbering can you imagine deaccessioning a dead frog it's not fun uh, but it does come up also in artwork collections you can ask me about that uh, later so in this case, our herd is fairly small. I think we've only ever numbered up to seven. Uh, and they are individually recognizable by the animal keepers. However, Condula, who is the baby in this slide, has also helped test in the field uh, collars for, rate for elephants that are under field research in the wild. So con that collar is very big. That's our curator, curator Tony Bartel, there demonstrating this big leather uh, collar with a sort of bump on it. That's the radio transponder with a big battery um, to see how Condola responded. How did the other elephants respond when he was wearing this weird new thing? Um, did he get grasses caught under it that would potentially irritate his skin? Did he get it caught on something that caused it to rip off or fail or possibly get stuck? So um, that's really helpful to know that there are lots of transponding devices. I write about it much more in my chapter. And since not that many people are having to deal with it, I'm going to move on. But I will say that the transponder may be an acceptable risk for some animals. Uh, so some of you may uh, remember or have been aware when this incident took DC by storm a couple of years ago, we had an escapee. We had a wandering red panda uh, who <laughs> everyone had to start looking for. And in fact, it, he was found due to a an avid uh, Twitterer who spotted him and called the police and called the zoo and he was found. But with an animal that might have a pattern of escaping or knows how to get out of their enclosure, putting a transponder on them might be a very good idea. Um, but in fact, Rusty was uh, sort of banished after he was caught to another enclosure that, uh, but indeed for breeding purposes, so he could meet a lady panda and be very happy there. And I'm just, that's Rusty's response tweet from uh, a fan. I'll say that was a spoof account. But panda security is, is, is a thing. So the person who, kudos, 10 points to the person who called out botanical collections, which are also living. Uh, you see here on the left an unfortunate effect of tree wounding and overgrowth, reactive overgrowth by the bark there in the Sure, it was a conservation effort uh, many years ago, marking the Pacific Crest Trail. However, the tree has since grown over the tag. Uh, there are better ways to apply metal tags to trees that avoid introducing uh, pathogens, such as viruses, uh, or, or cause scarring. Uh, so some of those I refer to elsewhere. You can safely nail into a tree, but you have to choose your materials property and ensure a certain distance so that the tree won't eat it over time, more or less. On the right, you have an example of a plant stake, uh, which is great, uh, placed near the roots, but not on the root specifically. This communicates information as well to the visitor. Besides, uh, if you look down, it says there's a, this is in our butterfly garden, and there's a little tag there that says host and nectar, so it explains the plant's purpose. And in outdoor exhibitions, that's another reason for potentially including technology in your labels, because visitors now have mobile phones and there are cell phone apps where people can learn much more information than is actually included on the tag. So yes, there are, uh, I do write a little bit more in my chapter about uh, barcoding and near field ID and all kinds of good stuff that's coming to you through the people who do that sort of thing. And also in botanical collections, we don't necessarily just use labels as exhibition tags, but to uh, to also maintain collection hygiene and protection. 
You see here on the left uh, some lovely orchids from our uh, Smithsonian Gardens. And on the right, you see a couple of hang tags and clips on the pots that indicate the status of this collection as uh, virus-free. So you can imagine that moving a plant stake from one plant to another just to say that it's part of the orchid collection should and is a managed thing to avoid introducing virus pathways from one plant to the other. So there are hygiene standards as well for using, collect, using stakes uh, in living collections. We're going to move on to uh, another special topic, which is historical labels. So if anyone can tell me, I think we're going to have another little pop quiz. What are some values of historic labels? We're going to pull up the slide on this while Susan pushes a poll or mic. So this one is also visual. Don't just look at the poll. Oh, I'm getting a no poll. All right. Well, we can. I will take a look over in the chat window and I will blow through this question and answer uh, session. So this object, I'm not going to tell you what it is exactly yet, but here's a detail of an object that was acquired and it was acquired with this dyed cotton tie and an original label on it. The object was numbered elsewhere on the metal on a durable surface on the non-rusty part of the base. And so my question to you guys is what would be the proper solution to care for the historic label and attachment? And I'm just going to suggest a few things which include, okay, so a, you've numbered it, you don't need to keep an old label that looks like it's actually ripped in half, so throw it out because you transcribed it. You could image it and put it, an image of that in your collections database. B, you could image it, remove it, and put it in the collections accession file. Or C, leave it there in situ if the red ribbon is a little uh, if, if it's a little funky and maybe it's not strong or threadbare, maybe you can replace it uh, or mend it as well or put it in a little uh, polyethylene bag to stay with the object. So I'm seeing something. Are they military parts? Save the little. No, you guys, you guys are you're kind of getting it there. This is great. Well, I'm going to just say remove and save, remove and save. Oh, wait until it falls off on its own. I love it. It's just going to pop off there one day. So it's a little hard for me to keep track of those numbers, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, you know give you the answer. Oh, the label is an artifact too, and you are right. The label, and not only the label. In this case, with curatorial input, this is my colleague Josh Gorman who is describing this object to us. It's in fact a patent model, uh, an object submitted for the registration of a type of machinery, um, and that label and tag is actually official government red tape from a government office. So in fact, the, that red tape was what was used to bind up and, and signify that these two items go together. This is parts A and B are both part of patent application. So you know, be aware that this entire thing is the object that we're trying to, trying to patent at this time. Later on, we see that the collection did actually find it quite important. If you look at the medium, in this collection record, it says the medium is tin and ribbon and paint. So if you chose to throw out the funky old dyed tape, you would actually have been throwing out part of the accession to object. So just to be sure, keep an eye on things. Try and find out what all their meanings are. Old marks might have meaning. A bit about preservation strategies to Preserve historic labels often include encapsulation, um, enclosures, or protective wrapping. This is back to the canoe example. Where this label has been worn away, this is one of the oars or rams that goes across and stabilizes the outrigger. On the right, you can see the letters are quite worn away. And in the, I'm sorry, on the right, you see the lashing of the cords that wore the label away. And in this case, we did a little preventative wrapping with polyethylene just to keep that wear and tear from continuing to happen on the object. So, so when, indeed, is it appropriate to remove an old label? So, you know, they can be visually appropriate. They can be incorrect. Uh, in this case, we have uh, a cranium. 
uh, in a medical collection. And I'm a little curious about this. Is this a label or is this a historic mend? There's a number on it, but it also goes across a big crack. And so maybe it's sort of a Band-Aid, if you will. Uh, so the question is, is that providing really good information or as evidence of historic use? So I think the jury is out on this one until I would discuss with the curator more what they feel is about that. It would be possible to lift this, restore the mend uh, with more sympathetic means, put it back, but it would be a lot of work. Here's another example of when labels were removed from objects. So this is a scrapbook held in the collection of birds over here. <coughs> Excuse me. And many of these labels, there's a note actually on the inside of the board saying why they were removed. And I'll call your attention to halfway down the page on the right, there's a little, little line um, that is a pin. Actually, these labels were pinned into a book to save them. But they were actually removed from the actual book, to, from the actual bird. So why is that? Well, this is to give you some context. This is actually a pretty important specimen uh, with its labels intact and encapsulated uh, to protect them from overhandling uh, and to be there with the bird. This is actually one, uh, collect one item collected by Charles Darwin uh, that is in our collection. And you can see that like the insect pins, there are a number of labels, but we've chosen in this case to keep them with the object and collection. Why would they be removed? On the slide on the right, sometimes early prepared specimens or poorly prepared specimens will actually continue to leach fats uh, and materials to the detriment of the label and the reading and understanding of the label. So it's possible that those labels were removed in a campaign to put more regular data and newer labels uh, aside from the collection uh, to keep them from being further damaged. But indeed, for that particular book, we actually decided to save the historic pins, uh, which just seems like an odd choice. Sometimes we just throw pins in the garbage, but in this case, they were insect pins. And a little bit about those with its association with Darwin and Gould could tell us a little bit, if you wanted to actually analyze them, where are those pins from? Who put them on there um, with all the other uh, books and materials? And so on the right, we have a more modern way of keeping those groups of labels together. The little ones that are flipped over to the left there are actually held together with uh, mylar and polyester webbing in a little encapsulated pocket. So instead of pinning those individual labels together that were with one specimen, they're now in a little pouch. Um, here's a special topic on metals and minerals. Metals and minerals can be reactive. Anything reacts to the environment, but there are some that will interact more, grow crystals perhaps, or uh, efflorescences, salts might migrate out that can actually push up and over any marking. So these are shell fragments. And indeed, if those individual shells uh, on the right superimposed over the little skull, if that actually has its own number, it's probably illegible now because of the salts that are over it. So one would want to consider another way of marking, perhaps metals. Or, or something that doesn't that has an irregular surface. I'm going to move on a little bit to special topic about materials and toxicity. I'm wondering if anybody recognizes this item or can read if they uh, have a good understanding reading understanding of French. If you know what that is, shout it out. And why would you maybe want to think carefully before using perhaps an eraser or a pencil or anything that would release uh, little fibers from this. Oh, somebody got it. Shout out to Stockholm and Shawnee. Indeed, that is a sort of trivet with an asbestos pad on there. So um, sorry, I'm seeing some other answers in there. But absolutely, that is an asbestos trivet. So one would want to be really careful about choosing where to label. I mean, handling in general. But um, anything that would sort of interfere with the fibers that might cause them to be released into the air. Furthermore, for those of you with drugstore, pharmaceutical, or store collections, uh, medical collections, you might have older collections with labels on them that you may understand or you may not understand. They're certainly not necessarily in, uh, in agreement with guidelines today for, for indicating toxicity. There's at least one of those in there that uh, that says poison, which is good, but some of them have uh, 
abbreviations. It's hard to understand what those materials are, and a common name for something formerly might not agree with today. Here's another collection shared by my dear colleague over at the Maryland State Medical Society. They have lots and lots of doctor's kits and old medicine kits. And one thing I can note is on the slide on the left, and we've talked about this, is that there's a label falling off of this object. And without a label, we don't know what's in that bottle, so it's impossible for somebody handling it. Ideally, they're not handling it often. It is behind a glass case. But if that label does fall off and become dissociated, we don't know what that material is and people can you know, not be protected from it. So I would at least remediate that with a small cotton tie um, to, or, or poly, polyethylene uh, sleeve to put it back on there, not necessarily scotch tape. Moving on, and I am watching the time. I see it's 3.02. I'm going to be getting to some really good stuff really soon. Um, so this last special topic is about marking plastics. Uh, marking plastics is a difficult choice. On the left over there, you see uh, a, a CD, a, record, a gold standard recording uh, CD that was used uh, in our own house for many years to record individual, to record sessions of our, some of our first broadcasts um, from the Smithsonian Jazz Works Orchestra. And you can see somebody applied uh, an adhesive label to it, thinking they were labeling it, it all looks really, really good, until that label decided to give up the ghost, peel it off, and peel off the data layer of, data layer of the CD with it. Um, there are guidelines for marking CDs. Not all of them are this vulnerable. Some of them have another polycarbonate sandwich layer above them. But most markers and, and scratches can interfere with the colored, sensitive recording data layer that the, uh, C that the CDs or computers read from. So it's really best to only mark the inner hub and use a list or a, uh, or a spreadsheet to catalog content. Oh, somebody's skipping ahead in the chat window. It's coming. Um, for plastics, I'm just showing you a couple of things that can happen to plastics. On the left there, you have uh, a comb that is suffering from crazing and cracking. It actually has, on the lower side, an accession number which doesn't seem to have interfered with the plastic. The cracks don't seem to be originating from there. But with, another, with a different kind of plastic, um, solvents in markers and using uh, solvents in barrier coats and top coats could cause a differential pattern or response to humidity that could cause uh, some, some damage, some deformation over time. The one on the right, we have no idea what that is, uh, or at least I don't. And those marks were put there by, uh, by someone who's developing this prototype of, uh, of a leg, a replacement leg. Uh, and so we just don't know how that surface is going to interact with those marks over time. I'm going to show you right here. This is totally uh, something that's in my drawer. This is a fob, a key fob. And you can see, that, or you can't see rather, that there are really fuzzy letters on it telling me what room th those keys belong to that was handed down to me. I don't know how old this fob is, probably about 10 at least 10 years old. Um, but the heat and, and humidity from hands holding it over time and just the nature of the plastic has caused the writing to actually uh, absorb into the plastic matrix. It is not sitting on the surface. This is permanently altered and also really hard to read. So that would be an instance where you, if you can't figure out what the plastic is, uh, you might want to avoid writing on it. So there's some great research on, uh, on plastics uh, developed by Pop Art, Preservation of Plastic Artifacts in Museum Collections. There is an affiliated publication, a great big book, that talks about opportunities and solutions for plastics. But the research is still going on. And here we go. This is really what you've been waiting for. So all the resources on how to do stuff. I have a number of guidelines out there and also some tutorials and supplies. And I distinguish guidelines, which are mostly written texts, from tutorials, which might actually have video supplements and pictures. And uh, I've got some vendors. I'm not going to name vendors, but I've got some screenshots of some places that you can uh, buy some stuff from. And let's go forward. So 
full disclosure, this is, uh, I believe it's a for-profit model uh, conservation center. I wouldn't usually um, necessarily shout out a referral, but based on the instructor, Helen Alton, you see her name on a lot, a lot of literature that's out there already uh, that is standard for marking uh, museum collections. She's done lots of workshops uh, for the American Association of Museums and the Registrar's Committee. So yeah, in a lot more time than I have here, you can see over about four or five weeks, there is a course available. Um, and it's not one time only. I think she'll probably do this a few times a year, or a couple at least, for the low, low price of $4.99. You can actually take a course and ask a lot more specific questions and do some practices, possible, possibly. Um, but she also has a lot of stuff online there at collectioncare.org that's available for free and that's uh, shouted out in your handout. There are lots of guidelines online. Um, this wonderful fairly new resource called Reorg is a whole approach for small collections and medium-sized collections to take on their biggest challenges and do it in some really great uh, with some great guidance on how to maximize space and how to take care of your objects. Um, one wonderful feature about it is it's available in several languages, French, Spanish, and English. So for training uh, international uh, volunteers, it's really useful. Find the language uh, of your choice. And there are some very practical guides. Uh, specifically for specimens and fossils, the paleontology portal at American Museum of Natural History is really useful. They have a nice page on specific, they have lots of great pages, but uh, st specifically they've got great guidelines for, uh, for marking very old collection items. Some of their links on the side, the downloads are a little out of date, but with some searching you can find them on other sites. That's their second page. And then the amazing, somebody called it out already in the uh, chat window I saw, the MRM5. So I came upon this, somebody told me about it about halfway into my literature search, and I said, where has this thing been all my life? Having come up in libraries and archives, I didn't actually see this book until very recently. And it is a marvelous book. There is an entire section on marking and labeling, again, longer than my own chapter contribution, maybe 25 pages with some charts, uh, some textual indications on how to uh, apply and how to consider materials by the type of material you're trying to label. Uh, so it's really, really great. I suggest you buy it or borrow it, uh, use interlibrary loan, do whatever was, is within the bounds of copyright to have a copy of this at your desk. It's very, very useful. Uh, Next up, there's also the National Park Service Museum Handbook that's published in two volumes and now available online. And they also have an appendix on labeling that's very useful, labeling and marking objects. You can buy kits and guides, kits with guidelines that match a lot of the tutorials that are out there. Um, you don't necessarily, depending on your collection, you might not need everything in there. Um, these are two different screenshots from two different uh, sources for it. And one thing I'm going to note is that one place has it for about $77, and one place has it for about $130. So I would look really closely at what's included in there, um, but you can also you can also do it yourself. You can hunt and gather materials. Um, I came across, or someone pointed me towards Ellen Carley's, uh, she's an independent conservator of private practice in Alaska, but she did a grant-based uh, project for the Alaska State Council on the Arts and published uh, about a workshop that she led out there in those in those regions. And it, you can see it's a little smaller, um, but you can probably put it together, she said, I think for about $50 as opposed to $75. And that is a collections label kit for small museums that is shouted out in the handout. Um, across the pond, we have Share Museums UK. They have a series of lovely little videos uh, about museum labeling and marking. And you can watch that. It's short, but it really goes through uh, most of what you need to know. Some health and safety notes. Um, when you're working with barrier coats, you see uh, B72 all over this page. There's also B67. Um, if you're using a system of a barrier coat and top coat, you want them to be in different solvents so they don't solubilize each other and erase or blur what uh, your marking medium is. So that's sensible. But 
you can also make your own B72 or B67 preparations in, acid, in various solvents. Um, but what I'm going to point out is that it's, some of it is available in acetone, some of it is available in toluene, and you want to think about what you're using and having the proper respiratory protection uh, if you're using the heavier solvents. Moving on, uh, labels, tags, resistol paper is one type of material that's used for uh, soaking in fluid collections. There are uh, labeling tape. It's called tape, but it's not self-adhesive tape. It's just ribbon that you write and sew onto textiles. I'm going to address foil-backed labels. I had a question uh, prior to the presentation as to whether it is appropriate to use a foil-backed label if you can't write on an object like a resin-coated photograph. Um, that is actually not appropriate. The foil-backed label was invented for a whole different purpose. It's not for, for marking individual objects themselves. That is for boxes and book spines in, col in circulating library collections. Um, so the foil helps it bond and, and shape to a round spine on a book label in a library collection. And it also helps the adhesive from creeping through and changing the contrast of the paper that bears the information. However, nothing is stopping the adhesive from soaking into the object. So don't apply them to objects. If you remember that picture of the the book with the the little book cloth book with the uh, label stuck right on there, that's a special collection book that today we would not apply uh, a label directly to. Um, it's important to manage the permanence of the papers and the labels that you're printing on, as well as the quality of your printing laser printer or ink or printer. We're not generally using inkjet printers with rare exceptions. Um, so there's some guidance on managing uh, the quality of your prints. Try not to substitute generic toner in your laser printer to save money because the bonding quality is different and the, so the uh, binding medium is different and they might not operate at the correct temperature for things. I had a call from our lots of people around natural history one year because all their labels were wiping off as they applied them. And that's because there was a mismatch of the toner and the cartridge that was used in the printers that they were using for labels. Moving on very quickly, bags and tags are another solution to uh, keep obviously broken items together or very small things with a card perhaps where you can't uh, write on a very tiny collection although someone here has managed to do that on that little tiny baby tooth. Um, sometimes it's just easier to keep something in a pouch if the pouch is not going to interact with the surface of the meat of the object you're trying to preserve. Um, it's not appropriate for all materials but it is an option. And I'm not saying get them off the shelf from your supermarket. These are very specifically made of neutral polyethylene uncoated plastic. So that's what you're looking for. A little bit about permanent marking. This question comes up a lot. What is actinic ink? Where can I get it? How do I use it? This goes back to the notion of permanent stamping of library and print collection materials. It is available from vendors. Actinic is, refers to a type of material that's uh, a, an element series in the periodic table. It basically means it's not reactive and it's not going anywhere and it's not going to change color. Uh, let me move forward. Uh, you can get it from vendors. You can also read about it from vendors, but you can also uh, read the Library of Congress's statement on it, ownership marking of paper-based materials available from the Library of Congress. They also make the product available should you choose to use it, but they also say it is not for all materials. It will not come up. It's really meant for a very specific purpose, which is to end library theft. And lastly, marking photographs comes up all the time. Again, please don't stick anything adhesive to a photograph. There are pencils that do work that are softer or waxier. Uh, that do mark the back of more plasticky photographs. New contemporary photography is one of those examples. I have a little bar across the right there um, over the lacquer. It's a little offset from where it should be, but there are graphite pencils. And if you must use a marker, try and pick one of the more stable markers and do not mark in the image area at all. Um, usually there's a little bit of a frame line, and if you have to mark, you might want to do it on the back side, very far away from the image area. And that 
is it. We have 15 minutes for Q&A. I am going to go switch my screen a little bit so I can see the parking lot and try and get to questions in the order which they were received. So, hang on. Okay, here's the parking lot. Let's go. Wow, there's a lot of questions. Okay. I, I think I hear Susan on mic. Is there anything you wanted to say to me? Yeah, I just wanted to say some of these are conversations that went on. And uh, if you want me to read them, I'd be happy to do that if that'll help. That, that would be great. So Susan's going to call out some of the things. Uh, and if I can contribute to that conversation, I will. I think that'll be a little bit more uh, efficient. OK. There was a question about um, when you've tracked an object that was marked with the wrong number, and you now need to correct that number, but you have no idea what they marked, what they used to mark it with in the first place, what would you do? Um, one of the responses was cover it. <laughs> one was make a new label. Um, but you may have an idea. Yeah, no, those are that's actually the cover it is a really nice solution. Um, there are newer methods uh, besides marking the individual object or trying to do erasures or possibly uh, lift with other solvents. You could drive that marking a little further into the surface if you don't know what you're doing. So if you don't have a conservator available, you could try one of the methods, which is to create a new label on, on uh, Japanese paper or a stable permanent paper, perhaps, and then put that in place with a barrier coat over it. Um, the barrier coat that you put down to adhere, that I mean, they, they kind of work as adherence and adhesives also, that possibly could cause some bleeding. I would go ahead and test with a little tiny, tiny, tiny pointed brush and uh, with the solvent that the barrier is in. maybe tap a little piece of paper to it, see if any color comes up or if it becomes tacky. Uh, but printing a, a new label and putting it over it would be a good solution. Um, that's, that's all I can say for that for right now. But we, I can, you can follow up with me and maybe we can talk about it a little bit more. And there's a yeah. question about, um, do you need to have anything other than the, the catalog number? Because you've got the catalog record. Indeed, yeah, but we do also think this is a great risk management question. You have the catalog record, but in the event of an emergency, and I've responded to a few, you don't necessarily have your laptop up and running, your system may be down. How do you know what is a collection object and what is it? If, you, if you're if you setting up a field response and recovery area, um, it would be great if someone can view what, what we call a human readable a uh, bit of information, a human readable number to know, no, we got objects one, two, three, four out of the, se the secured building. It is now located in the emergency recovery zone. And a registrar would be able to look at that object and say, one, two, three, four is here and note it in on a notepad, you know, until you can get your collection system up and running uh, to deal with an emergency recovery scenario. So we always want to try for at least a bare minimum of one human readable uh, identification on an object, and two if you can manage it. If you do have a really big, heavy, jug-handled vase with two uh, prongs, you don't necessarily want to pick it up and turn it over, but you could use a hang tag, possibly on one of the arms, as well as a number on its base. In an emergency scenario, anything could happen that tag could burn up or be ripped off, but then you would still have a number on the object itself. OK, so there's a question. If you had a pair of skin-hide boots and a large piece of the leather lashing broke off, would you label that piece with the same number or so it doesn't get separated? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I would think. I would try and manage the separation more than write a number. I mean, leather is an absorbent material. Um, I don't know how big, but if it's like anything like one of my boot laces, it's not very big to write a number on it. You could probably try and manage it, but I would think about using uh, an enclosure, um, such as a four-flap wrapper of paper or a see-through polyethylene bag to keep with the object and write the number on that uh, outer enclosure. There were, keep couple, it together in a box. Yeah. there were a couple of questions about 
if you had um, outdoor objects that were, uh, you know, like artworks or wagons or how do you label those? There were yeah, so that's actually that's a terrific question. Um, a lot of that, I, I, I actually, our own gardens has that, and that's why when I showed the plant stake, that's an engraved sign. It's an engraved uh, sign on a very specific uh, type of plastic, or you could get aluminum or stainless steel um, if you can afford that. Um, but sign making companies do engraved signs for that reason, because you have something that is legible based on, on light and contrast and shade instead of color and dyes that uh, that may fade. Um, so that's an option. Uh, engraving or stamping. Uh, that I'm also going to bring up the fact that though if you use metal, a lot of uh, collections signs have been disappearing, even in our own area here. And I generally advocate for not necessarily using uh, bronze to replace outdoor statuary labels because people do steal them for melting them down. And that becomes a uh, regular expense and loss for museums. So if you can find signage that's maybe made of coated printed aluminum and work with an outdoor sign manufacturer, um, they should be able to tell you ones that are more durable than others. Uh, so that is a solution. Um, there were some questions about guidelines for coating for uh, um, coated paper, for marking on coated paper. Um, so that won't accept uh, pencil and are too dark. Oh, too dark. Well, the coated paper thing, I think I addressed that in the uh, marking photographs uh, slide, is that you do have to go to a softer pencil. You know, we're often used to using 2B. If you go to an art supply store, you can get the full range up to 6B. 6B is very soft. Um, and ideally, when you're marking something like a photograph, you actually want to be doing that on a hard surface so you don't impress down and, and sort of engrave into the photograph anyway. Um, but there are waxier pencils, waxier mediums that do stick. And there are even grease pencils that you can use that uh, stick on a little bit more. But then you might want to consider using interleaving between the coated paper so it doesn't rub off on the next object. OK. Um, there was a question about uh, white India ink that settles in the bottom, in the bottle. Are there other? Yep. White yes, there are definitely other. There are other formulations. You can thin uh, titanium dioxide white paint in solution, and you do. That's one of the things about time and having enough time to be able to do it. It's true that if you don't do labeling for months and months, that your materials might dry out. Um, you do have to think about uh, the solvents that are in that and how often you're going to replace them. That's one reason why sometimes uh, heavier solvents are used that don't evaporate as quickly as well, so that it doesn't thicken up uh, in your solution. But I would go to the MRM5 and some of the tutorials uh, to look for other materials um, that are available. like titanium dioxide white paints that you can dilute and use in a pen uh, or on a brush can be great, but it can be inappropriate from some other materials like sensitive plastics. Um, so do be, you know, identify what your surface is and figure out the solution. Um, again, I'm going to point you to the MRM5 that has some really nice uh, discussion of when to use some materials and when not to. And I see I'm getting a time warning. So we've got probably five minutes. Um, OK. Same thing for the military question. I'm going to, I believe that the MRM5 has something on artillery and military specifications. Uh, so that's something of interest. I'm, I'm not sure if that's armament and if you're handling the armament. But for very high security objects, things that you would not want going along, that might be a time that you actually engrave and interfere on a metal object. Um, if it's something that needs to be traced for legal reasons of legal protection, such as a high security uh, gem or a military object uh, that would, could be functional and is not made dysfunctional, uh, that might be one odd time when you're actually engraving directly into an object. It's very rare uh, to do that, but there, there may be a consideration. And there's a question uh, about bad handwriting. And oh, bad bronze. handwriting? Yeah, and bronzes. 
Oh, is, lost, that the, is that the same question? I uh, yeah, they're in the same question. Zachary Harper trying to avoid bad handwriting. It's applying small printed accession labels between a barrier coat on small bronze sculpture. It absolutely is. It absolutely is. That's there are some great tutorials out there for uh, creating uh, labels with a computer and a printer with a proper toner. And it also really allows you to get down to a scale that is discreet and yet uh, and yet legible, more legible than, than handwriting. So there's definitely options. That's certainly what is done for uh, vials, uh, biological specimens, and inserting tiny tiny image, tiny printed labels into wet collection uh, vials with the specimen. There, uh, there are quite a few guidelines out there on that. And hopefully they're referred to in my citations. But if not, um, grab my uh, contact info, and I will get it to you. Besides this handout, I have a really, really full bibliography that I've been managing on Zotero, uh, which is a, a, a citation manager um, that can be made public. I'm not sure yet whether I'm going to make that public or not, uh, because I have a lot of sort of personal notes in there about, uh, about some commentary. But I do have a lot of information, so follow up with an email on that one. Yeah, and and note that you can download the uh, handout now, but I think we're going to stop. We've come to the end. I will post the recording uh, as soon as I get it, and I will put an announcement on our Facebook and Twitter page. But you can also go to the archives and check. So thank you, Nora. Thank you, Mike. And I think we're done. Bye-bye. And remember next time. Uh, Deaccessioning with uh, John Simmons. Bye Thanks bye. so much, everybody. Been great. Bye. Bye. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. Don't please don't uh, don't leave without taking your the uh, the evaluation. This is a hot link to it. Okay. Bye bye. We look at those evaluations, so they're really important.